The webinar is now streaming live on YouTube. Good. Uh... Hello, YouTube. Sounds like we are all set. It sounds like we are all set. We'll give it another, oh, 60 seconds. We're now at 64 participants. So gosh, people are joining. So it does take time sometimes for people to connect and for the technology to warm up or whatever it is the technology does. So we'll just give it another uh, another minute. Well, we are on Mars. Everything needs to heat. <laughs> <laughs> I do love that title slide. Well, it shows the modern sediments and the old sediments all in one shot. Mm. And the curious thing about these dunes is actually that you see three sets of climbing ripples and on Earth we usually only have two. And don't ask me to explain it because even our sedimentologists can't explain that yet. So we are taking a lot of pictures of ripples here, here in that area. You see the three sets that that's, this is the big ripple, the normal climbing ripple, and then you have another set of climbing ripples, which is the, the peculiar thing. It's a strange thing. So it's now two minutes past, so I did, I did promise to leave, I give people a couple of minutes. So um, good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to the Society for Popular Astronomy. Um, I've been asked to just explain, i just say a few words about who the, the SPA are. We are uh, the, I would say, I think it's really fair to say that we are the leading UK society for entry-level astronomy in the UK. Um, we uh, do a lot of uh, stuff for people starting out in astronomy, especially young stargazers. We also uh, run events, which we normally do, but since then the world has exploded. <laughs> so we're, we're not doing that at the moment, but we do run a lot of online things. Uh, there's uh, uh, Vicky Duncalf's uh, uh, live streams on Facebook. You should check out, uh, uh, they're about weekly. And we have these uh, quarterly meetings. And for today's quarterly meeting, uh, we are enormously lucky to have uh, Dr. Suzanne Schwenzer uh, from the Open University, who is going to talk to us about curiosity at Gale Crater, Mars, volatiles, alteration and habitability. I'm talking, uh, and I think you're part of a, a NASA Mars mission, is that right? Yes, I am a science team member of the Gale Crater mission, the Curiosity City mission, and I actually would have been on shift and do um, operations work this Friday, but that wasn't to be because we have a new member of the spacecraft family around Mars or on the way to Mars, the UAA mission, I say about that later. And they took the slots in our deep space network, which new missions should be doing because they need that. And so I wasn't, but otherwise I would have been on shift yesterday night. Wow. Wow. So um, I should say to, to everybody, uh, if you would like, have any questions, uh, please pop them in the Q&A box. We'll be monitoring those. Um, uh, it's probably a better place than the chat. Uh, but I will monitor that too. And Robin Skagel, our vice president, will be uh, uh, monitoring the chat on YouTube. So uh, there'll be a, an opportunity after Suzanne's talk to uh, to answer some of these uh, uh, questions. So please pop, pop your questions in and we'll do what we can to get to them. And uh, Suzanne, over to you. Thank you. So I'm going to talk about the mission I know best, which is the Mars Science Laboratory mission Curiosity to Gale Crater Mars. And if there is anything, please keep Stephen busy and send him a lot of questions. If there are urgent questions, make it sure he knows about that. I'm happy for him to interrupt me and uh, answer questions to a slide uh, while we go. And with no further ado, what you see here on my title slide is what we have done on Mars. And if I say we, I am, of course, a very, very small, um, little, little part of that huge team, which is about 270 scientists and about that many of engineers, atmosphere administration and everything else you need to keep a mission going. And we are on Mars for 2,832 souls. A soul is a Martian day. It's a little longer than an Earth day, but all of you who do astronomy know all of the orbital mechanics much better than I do. So I leave it at that. We've driven um, almost 25 kilometers by now. 
And with that, what have we found? So since a good rule of any talk is tell people what you are going to tell them. So I will talk about Gale Crater as a landing site. We say crater all the time. Why? What is a crater on Mars? We, I will introduce Curiosity to you. She is a beautiful machine, a geochemistry laboratory. And I will then talk about what she has found. So the stratigraphy, reading the book that contains the history of the planet. While we study this rock from the bottom all the way up, it is about reading the book of geology history. And I personally look at alteration minerals, what happens when water hits these rocks. And I will talk about that because that's key to the habitability, to the question, is there anything that ever could have lived there? And then methane, you can't talk about Mars without talking about methane, especially after July of last year, where we found 20 parts per billion per volume. And I explain that unit when we get there. And then I have a bit uh, of an outlook. First of all, where is Curiosity going to go? And where? Uh, and there are other missions. I already mentioned one in our chat before we started. There are three missions going to Mars right now. The advertisement picture that we had in uh, on the website uh, showed the ExoMars rover from the ESA and um, so the Rosalind Franklin rover. This isn't going to go in 2022. The circumstances Stephen has mentioned has led to some delays there. And uh, that is going in the next launch window. Again, orbital mechanics here when Mars and Earth go around the sun and you need to be in Mars needs to be there when we get there, that kind of thing. Uh, and so they will now go in 2022 because these launch windows are all 26 months. So I am going to talk mostly about a mission that's already there, but will close out with an outlook of what's going to be there soon as per February this year. Now I said crater. What you are seeing on the image now is how a crater forms. And that is on any planetary body that has a hard, rocky surface. So Earth, Mars, Venus, whichever you are looking at, Mercury, the Moon, uh, they form craters like this. And what happens here, and I am being told, you see actually my cursor is a projectile, a large piece of rock comes in and from here and hits the surface. You see that the surface is made up of three layers. That's so you better see what is actually happening. So this rock comes hurtling in at high speed and hits the surface just here. But what happens then is different from when you hit your car with your fist or something. But what happens, that, that gives a dent and that's it. But what happens here instead is you have this rock coming in at high speed and burying itself into the surface. All of this happens very, very quickly. Uh, and it goes down until the kinetic energy is used up and is turned into mostly heat. From that, uh, you see shock waves, pressure waves uh, going outwards. The uh, rock down here is heavily compressed. And what then happens is comparable in the physics to an, a subsurface explosion. So the best way to study these are the nuclear test sites where they buried uh, nuclear bombs underground. The features that they find is, are very similar to the features we find in the natural craters that occur from um, these meteorite impacts. So you see a lot of heat because you have more rock that's uh, say at least a thousand degrees Celsius and it's quite a volume depending on what the diameter is here. And so most of it is still going down at this stage, material is flowing down. But of course, up here where you only have the atmosphere, there is nothing to stop this. And so material will get ejected here. And this is how you get meteorites from Mars into space, which then eventually can travel to Earth. And on the next panel down here, you see what happens when the motion uh, downwards motion has come to an end. The ro compressed rock here starts to relax and the surface goes back up and it will overshoot the level it had before, while the sides keep going outwards and you have this ejecta curtain going out and falling onto the surface. Everything gets modified. These sides are over steepened in the same way that if you tip a bucket of sand, the hill that you form will be too steep initially um, to uh, and it will adjust itself to Earth's gravity. 
to have an angle of repose where it is actually stable. And uh, all you see in red on that, uh, on all of these panels, red and purple colors, I mean, really hot molten rock. And so above 900 degrees Celsius, you have a lot of molten rock. And on the bottom, you see how a final crater looks like when it is very fresh. So you have the central uplift that has overshoot where the position where the rocks came from when the underground relaxed. You have a pool of molten rock in the crater mode. And you have these sides which have terraces where everything has adjusted to the gravity. And with that, I show you how Gale Crater looks like. So you see immediately features that I spoke about, for example, the rim here and the terraces. But you also see a central mound, as we call it. And this central mound is not necessarily a central uplift, because when you look at it, it looks like sediments. You have layers and layers and layers of sediments. And that's not how the central uplifts normally look. However, a central uplift should be there. The crater is, three, uh, is 150 kilometers in diameter, so it should have a central uplift, but maybe it's buried. Maybe it had been eroded away and then the crater had been filled by something. That's something we do not know and we are slowly trying to piece together during the mission, but we haven't reached the mound yet, so we only have some rocks from it and so far all we have found is sediments. Let's look at this, the upper panel first. Uh, what you see here is an artist concept of Gale Crater and you see the cut through. And what I don't quite like is that the sediments in the middle go all the way through because uh, we don't really know it could be right. It doesn't have to be right because there could be a central uplift just buried under this. But that aside, what you should be looking at here is the black circle in the middle of the image because that was the landing ellipse and we landed pretty much in the middle and there is this gray triangle with is the piece well as fan. That's a deposit of a river. The river came down from the side of the crater uh, at fairly high speed and deposited gravel here in this fan deposit. And these environments are important because they are indicative of flowing surface water. And should we find rounded rocks there, well, that was the thought, it might be sustained water and sustained water is always good for life and so if we were to look for life anywhere we, it's those environments that we are looking for that said curiosity itself doesn't have the instruments to look for life what we are looking for is the environmental conditions that could sustain life so now let me talk about the panel on the lower right you see basically now the top down view of what's uh, in the artist uh, concept. And you see the red lines coming in. These are crevices and little valleys where water could have flown, not all go through into the middle, but they might just be covered under another layer of sand or something. What we you see in purple outlined the fan, and then you see the layered hard rock unit, and it has some fresh craters on it. So it's a fairly young unit that isn't being very much eroded. And that was the so-called parking lot that we landed in and had a safe landing in. And then we drove all the way to the clay unit and we had to take a little detour because what's black there, these are actually dunes and we can't drive over those. So we had to find a gap in the dunes to get to the green sulfate area. We have investigated the sulfate area. We are still in it. We are doing another drill in it just as I speak. And then we are off to the sulfates unit. I have another image of that at the end where I show the entire mission progress. So that's the rover. And if we were in a lecture hall, I would now explain to you that I use this picture because Roger, Roger Beans, the PI of ChemChem, who is the person in this image, um, has the exact same height than me. Well, he's probably a couple centimeters taller. So imagine a person of a meter 80 uh, height, and this is the rover behind him. And you now know how big Curiosity is. This is, of course, a scale model that's used for demonstration. Um, but you have a good impression how this one ton vehicle looks like compared to a human if you could wander around it. And I have seen it in a 3D simulation with a virtual reality glasses on. It's impressive, especially if you kneel down to investigate some rocks and it, you turn around and they have just put it behind you electronically. It's an impressive piece of machine and it's as big as it looks here. 
This is a more technical view of it. We have 10 instruments on board. And if you wonder how fast we are, the top speed would be four centimeters a second. If you start moving your finger from the left of whichever keyboard you use to the right in the next about minute or so, then you know how slow this is. So it is very, very slow and we are not going for racetrack speed because we are driving off road. And any one of you who has ever driven off road know that the top speed of a vehicle counts for nothing if you are in an off road terrain. What counts is the suspension, the gears, the wheels uh, to get through whatever um, the terrain throws at you. And so he, let's look at the science instruments. Uh, in the middle, this green box there is the radiation, is, uh, sorry, uh, down here, this green little box here is the radiation assessment detector, which was switched on four days after launch, and which uh, looks at the radiation dose an astronaut would get if they had flown with this mission. And that's in preparation for a human mission to Mars, just in the same way as the Perseverance rover is preparing that. We have uh, DAN, dynamic albedo of neutrons, which looks down at the surface to measure water and chlorine. And also looking down at the surface is MARDI. MARDI was the Mars ascent camera recording our landing, but we since use it to get a recording of the places we drive through because it focuses on the, uh, on the surface. It can just take the pictures and uh, we can download them whenever we need them. And so there is no decision making, no added burden to um, the planning and operations, but it gets a very unbiased view of the surface because it gets a picture when you stop. And uh, that's different from science cameras because when you appoint a science camera, there's always a human decision, which is a good thing on one hand, but for statistics, uh, you get a more unbiased picture if you look at um, something at random. Now we have ChemCam, which is the chemistry camera, which is a camera and a laser. The laser hits a rock and you get chemistry from it. I talk about this later. We have REMS, which is the weather station. We have APXS, which is also a chemistry instrument, which uh, targets alpha particles at the surface and measures the X-rays that come out of it. And uh, we, we have in the rover belly, Kemin and Sam. Kemin is the chemistry and mineralogy instrument, uh, which is an X-ray diffraction instrument, which shines an X-ray beam at the sample and gets a diffraction pattern out. I have data of that instrument that I can show you later. And Sam is a volatile instrument with an oven. I'll also talk about this later. What I have glossed over are uh, Mali and mast cam, and there's also the navigation camera. So we have a lot of eye we have the navigation cameras and hazard cameras, which take the engineering pictures and keep us safe, but are also used for science. Every picture that you get is great for science, so we will look at all of them. And we have MASCAM, which is a color camera, can also do stereo, and um, that's a lot used to assess the terrain in terms of geology and stratigraphy. And we've got Mali, which is a close up hand lens imager type of camera where you can get the rocks really close and investigate what's in them that way. Now with that, let me say a few words about landing on Mars because in February, we are hopefully going to see this with a Perseverance rover, fingers crossed, Perseverance isn't off the ground yet. That's on the 30th of this month, so just five days away. Now, Mars is hard, and that, this was the scoreboard before Curiosity landed. So Earth had 15 successful missions, and Mars had, well, <laughs> scored 24 of them, if you wanted amongst them, unfortunately, Beagle 2. However, now we are at 17 to 24, because that was before Curiosity, and Curiosity, as we all know, made it eight years ago, and we have the inside lander successfully landed on Mars since then as well. And this is what I expect to see um, with a Perseverance rover, very tense faces staring at screens, completely oblivious of uh, their surroundings while this is happening on Mars. And these are all screenshots from a NASA video you see uh, on the upper right corner, you see the source of it. Um, 
this is an artist's concept where the rover still packed in this heat shield comes towards the atmosphere. And as they said in their seven minutes of terror video uh, for the curiosity landing, Mars has an atmosphere. It's thick enough that you have to deal with it, but not thick enough to finish the job. And which means you could burn up if you hit the atmosphere at the wrong speed, the wrong angle, and did get that wrong. But it isn't um, thick enough to land on a parachute. Uh, this one ton vehicle. The Mars Exploration Rovers, of course, they were much lighter weight. They could just use airbags and bounce off the uh, remaining energy. Here, uh, Curiosity had a different technique. This is the Sky Crane, also an artist's concept, still with a rover packed under it, wheels folded up, and the retro rockets slow it down. Finally, the rover is lowered down on bridles, the wheels are flicked out, and uh, it will be sat on Mars, uh, hopefully, and Perseverance uses the exact same technique. And there we are, mast and arm still folded in an artist's concept again. The first real picture from Mars is this one. It's taken by the Mars Reconnaissance Orbiter, uh, by the high-rise camera there. And this instrument was tilted towards the landing site. Of course, when MRO was uh, entering Mars orbit, it would never know that it would be doing this. So it was an experiment that went fantastically well, because what you see here is the fully inflated parachute in the parachute phase of the landing. That parachute would then be ejected and the sky crane would uh, start to do its work. And so this is the first curiosity image from Mars. And this is how the landing site looked. Don't don't tell this to your children or grandchildren, they'll never tidy up their room again, because we scattered quite a few things around. Um, you see the back shot and the parachute in the lower left, and you see in the upper right, this black smudge is the sky crane landing where that impacted. On the lower right, there is the heat shield that impacted there, and Curiosity is sitting in the middle, safely away from everything. And what we did from there is we decided that uh, this is the area we are sitting in exactly there is where we are and uh, here you see this triple junction of terrain you have a very bright toned terrain on the upper right you have the darkest toned terrain where curiosity is currently sitting in and there is this boundary that you fairly faintly can see here the best way to distinguish the two is to see that there on the right of the boundary are many craters, on the left there are much fewer craters. And so this triple junction could tell us about three units and how they link together. And this is where you start to read the book of the uh, geologic history there. And if I frequently say you read the book of geologic history, rocks stack themselves up or are being stacked up by the geologic processes with the oldest at the bottom and the youngest at the top. If you have a planet like Earth that has tectonics, it sometimes gets flicked over, but let's leave these complications out. Uh, normally, you know where's the bottom and where's the top, and then you can investigate them layer by layer, and they will tell you about the environmental conditions and about what has happened at that place at the time these rocks were deposited. And that's what I mean by reading the history book. But let's get back to the first real rover image on Mars. You see the black uh, squares missing, so not all images came down uh, at this point, but this is the rover and the mast was up at this point, of course, and we see the deck and we see some gravel lying on it, but we have a life nice rover. And from there, we took it to Yellowknife Bay, that's down here this triple junction I pointed out. And before I explain any more about this graph, I want to point out the uh, X and Y axis, because that uh, hill here looks awfully steep, right? It isn't. Because if you see at the distance traveled in kilometers here, you have a scale from zero to about 15 where the rover is at this moment. And the elevation is about a thousand meters here. So you have a 14 fold exaggeration of height and with this of the steepness of this hill. We've climbed quite some hills, but not as it looks here. However, we are, and that's what this graph demonstrates really nicely going uphill. We are going up section. We are going from younger to from older to younger 
sediments. And you see that we started at Yellowknife Bay, we went to the Parham Pills. This line indicates where we went from the so-called Bradbury group, one of these units, into the Stimson Formation, and other unit. And we distinguished these units by the look of their rocks, by the grains, the chemistry, and all the evidence that we can put together. And then we went to Murray Buttes, and everything in black are just geographic names. Anything in white is formation names that we have given a bit because the rocks are really distinct. And then we went to the hematite unit, clay unit, and we are about to enter the sulfate unit in the next few months. So what have we learned? This is to me one of the most iconic images. Something fell out of the sky and started its mission here. We are on our way. And we are on our way to look at the rocks. And this is one of the first investigations we did. It's the Hotta conglomerate. So if you look at this, you will see a lot of reddish, beige things. But if I zoom in, something will remind you probably of your last hiking holiday, where you might have been in the mountains and seen rounded gravels. And where do you normally find rounded gravels? Well, yeah, in rivers. Right, especially when rivers come down steeper mountains and transport coarser grain material because the water energy is higher. And so this was a really exciting finding because we found the rounded gravels, a conglomerate on Mars, and that means sustained water. So what we did is we did count those gravels. And here you see on the left, a picture from the Atacama Desert and on the right, a picture from Sorry, on the left is Mars. I, I always get this wrong. On the left is Mars and on the right is the Atacama Desert. But you can't really t uh, pick them apart. You need to memorize which one is which because they pretty much look the same. So what we did is we analyzed these gravels and we analyzed their grain size and we saw how much is in every of these little grain size bins that we made. And we compared it to the Atacama Desert here in red, and we had three of them on Mars. And from that, and knowing the laws of physics around that, what we could find is that this was a small stream about knee to hip deep going down a hillside and then depositing the gravels here as it went into a more shallow um, environment and the water lost its energy. So this was one of the first really significant findings because it told us there was water and there was sustained water flow, not just a flash flood gone in, in 10 minutes. And that was that there was sustained repeated water rolling these rocks downhill. And that's important for habitability because water is one of the key ingredients. So now getting into other environments, what you should, what you immediately see here is if you look at the scale, um, the scale, you have much finer grained rocks, but you have these laminations and these are one at a time deposited under certain circumstances. And if you look very closely at the top image, you see some are very parallel to each other. Others are not parallel to each other. So you can deduce the depositional regime from that uh, in each of these pictures. And you can piece together the picture of the water, the water energy, and even the source region if you add the chemistry to that. And here are just a couple more images of that. You need to get up close. You can't say whether this is a lava flow or a sedimentary deposit from afar. This is why we spent quite some time driving around and really looking at all these rocks in detail. And we finally settled on one area here where the rocks are very fine grained and they are cross cutting features like this little feature here. And what we did there was the very first drill of, uh, sorry, I've changed the direction of the slide. So let's go back one. So this is the fine grained sediments. And if you think these further, then the next thing to happen is if you have finer and finer grained sediments, the water gets calmer, the water gets eventually 
not so much new inflow. And what you could see happening here is that this lake that there was once and where we have seen the little rivers come in, the flattening out and all the stacking up of uh, the sediments, you could think it might have dried out. Can we find evidence for that? And yes, we can. And this was much later in the mission that we found this piece of rock and it has what's called mud cracks. You all have seen these mud cracks and you have seen these mud cracks when it has rained for a couple of days on and off and then you go to your garden and you live like I do here in Milton Keynes on the Oxford clay. You have these puddles that have uh, little tiles on top that are very thin and eventually the wind will carry them away or the next rain will destroy them. So that's what happened here. A, an indication of drying out and actually having a repeated wet and dry cycle. That also is very important because on Mars there might have been or there was a climate change uh, in at the end of the Norhian to the early Hesperian where the wet conditions that we saw earlier will have changed to dry conditions, but it might not have been in just one go. So what we can do here is put this book together and how geologists put this book together is actually um, by drawing a little box for every single rock. And all that you need to look at here is if this box sticks out far to the right, what you have is a piece of coarse grained rock that is very resistant to weathering. If this, uh, if it doesn't, but it uh, is a shorter bar, um, then the rock is soft, it might be clay, it is weathering away easier. And so just from looking at this zigzag pattern, you will be able to see that there are a lot of different rocks, but there is a pattern to it. We had a lot of uh, those that go way out to the right and which are labeled as conglomerate or uh, something uh, down here. And then we get into units that are a lot uh, less weathering resistant and they have signatures such as laminated mudstone here. I am not going into any big details at this point, so, but if there are geologists on the line, feel free to ask me later. I'm really happy to elaborate on that. On that. And now I'll come back to uh, what I uh, thought I had as the next slide, the drilling. So this is back to the area where I explained about the finest grained rocks. It's um, the, uh, at Yellowknife Bay, still very early in the mission, 170 souls in, we did our first drill. And you see the drill is sitting on a couple prongs here. This is the drill in the middle and the drill bit went down. And of course, when you do something for the very first time, you are be being very careful. So on the right here, you see our pre-drill, our test drill uh, to see how does the rock react? How does our drill react? We were doing this for the first time after all. And even in the pre-drill, the thing that immediately amazed us is Oh, red Mars is gray, just half a centimeter below the surface, because this is a 2.5 centimeter diameter hole, and the, the right one is about half a centimeter deep. We then did the full drill and the gray continued. So what does this mean and why is this significant? Again, going back to the um, question of habitability, can anything live there. So if you do, if you think about this, red is oxidizing, it's a harsh environment. And if you think of can ever anything live there or has there ever anything ever lived there, you also want to ask the question, if it had lived there, would I find the triasis four billion years later? And the question here is, if you have that harsh oxidizing environment and you have uh, organic phases that might be traces of that, they would have been completely destroyed after uh, 4 billion years. If you have a more benign, a gray, a reducing environment, you have a much better chance to find what is called biomarkers, like the traces of the remnants of something that might have lived there. So with that, um, let's look at the all the drill sites that we have. And so all the drill sites that we have, you see a different um, in color, they are different in the material properties, and they have told us a lot about the chemistry. And you see there is not really a, uh, when you have, you have red and gray ones, so it is really dependent on the on the geological unit, you are in what the color is, but there are nevertheless things that you can find that are 
decisive to the environment and they tell you a lot about the geologic past. So this is where we came from Yellowknife Bay uh, on the top left here and then we went down and every of these red dots is a drill hole and they got more frequently as we were working around Parham Hills and Mariah's Pass and then we had um, the drive through the dunes where of course uh, drilling isn't any good and then we came back to the rocks at Vera Ribbon Ridge that's the heat hydrogen rich unit. We did a lot of them there. And we are now actually uh, a little further on here. I'll have a more extended traverse later on. So, but that's the last the drill hole uh, that we did is Glasgow over here. And that's the Glasgow drill hole on Sol 2754. And now let me show you what we found. This, these little pie charts are giving you an impression of the mineralogy. I'm not going into any details here. I am fully aware I'm talking to astronomers. You might have heard olivine because that's a um, mineral that is seen in astronomical spectroscopy and we have olivine on Mars, but that's not necessarily what I want to talk about here. What I want to talk about here with you is the light green wedge that and the blue wedge. So, and the red wedge, these three wedges, the light green wedge is clay minerals. Clay minerals are incredibly important because they are what keeps the water in a soil. If you are doing gardening and you have a lot of sand, you know, as soon as the sun come out, you have to carry the water around because it will dry out immediately. Your neighbor who might have a bit more clay in their ground is much more lucky because the clay will swell and build the water into its structure when water is there and it will slowly give it off when the environment gets dry. And so these are important indicators for the habitability of an environment. And the blue wedge is silica. Crystalline silica is one indicator for water rock interactions and intense water rock interactions. Silica and iron, by the way, is one element that stays back when a rock weathers and uh, leaches, but it's also an element that gets transported by water. So it tells you a lot about water rock interactions. And the red is hematite, which also tells you about water rock interactions. And so if you look at this, uh, graph that Liz Rampe did, um, you see that in the beginning we had a lot of green wedges and these green wedges are clay rich and then for Mariah's Pass uh, they went completely away. There is no clay in these rocks. But then you start to slowly get clay again. And the hematite is also, the, the red wedges are also uh, distributed not evenly across all of them, but you have more or less of it. And this is how we read from the mineralogy what the environment looks like. And you see also here that when the blue wedge, the silica rich material gets really big, the clay goes away. So what does this tell us? And we are figuring this out right now, but it tells you about temperature differences, about differences in how, how much water was there compared to the rock, pH. If you have more silica, you might have been in more acidic environment than if you have more clay. It is those differences that we are looking at here. And uh, now let me come to chem chem. Uh, chem, because chem chem is one of the chemistry instruments. And this is a beautiful shot of the chem chem instrument and in fact, the entire rover head in the lab. Of course, we didn't bring a clock to Mars, right? So this is the chem chem instrument up here with its laser and the mirror behind. But you also see the two mast cameras, the M100 and the M34, different focal length. Astronomers know what I'm talking about, and the navigation cameras here. And you can do stereo, they have an overlapping range, and they can also do spectral by um, you applying filters. So this is how the instrument looks, and it applies a laser beam to the rock, it vaporizes the material, and it measures the spectra of this vapor plume. And what you get out here is a, an x-axis that has all of these spectral uh, wavelengths and an intensity. And I don't have a number here because it's normalized. I don't need to tell you the details because luckily in this image, we have this black line. If you shoot a random Martian basalt, then you should get something that looks like this black line. And 
so if you look at this black line here, this is what we were expecting and what we were actually getting in many of the first shots with slight variations. However, then at, the, at this target called crest, we got something that's totally different. So you see the, the, in the red line down here, the magnesium is a lot lower. Silica is a lot lower. Aluminium is almost not there. And calcium is a lot higher. So what's that? Right. And now we needed to, to think, what do we do? Well, there's a distinguishing feature here. This material is very white. So we were looking for something that's very white and a bit bigger. Because in something that's small, you, if you are really eagle-eyed and have a big screen, you see this cross. So this cross goes across the white and some of the black material. So maybe this is a mixed analysis. Let's get to the target rapid time, which is much bigger. And you can fit that cross actually fully on the white material. And what happened then is you barely had any magnesium. You barely had any silica. Aluminium detections were completely gone. And calcium goes way up. So what you have here is a very different mineral. The, different, the mineral is called gypsum. And it's a calcium sulfate. We can't measure sulfur in the wavelengths I'm showing you here. And so we need the APXS instrument to measure the sulfur. And sure enough, it did find sulfur. So we are having calcium sulfates, which is also indicative of weathering and secondary alteration, evaporation processes, and all of this. Now, going on to look at this in more detail, again, an earth analog, this time made really easy by having a pocket knife in the picture. We didn't bring those to Mars. So this is Earth. And these are these gypsum veins that we have in terrestrial rocks. And on here, on the left, there is an image from the ChemChem -chem instrument where you see the same type of pattern in these gypsum veins. And it's calcium sulfate, which has some water. You might also hear about bassanite and anhydride in this circumstance on Mars. And bassanite is gypsum with less water and anhydride is calcium sulfate with no water. So that's what we found. And it is very exciting because it speaks for the evolution of this alteration environment and for the evolution of the environment in terms of habitability. We can also be looking at much more fine grain details. So we can find sodium here, which again is um, indicative of very concentrated uh, fluids, especially if it comes with chlorine and boron. Um, and you can, here you see the scale at which we are actually looking. This is less than 10 millimeters. So we have a very fine uh, scale here where we can do the chemistry. And each of these bars in, uh, dedicate, uh, um, show how much of an element is there. So point out one would have no boron. This happens to be the boron plot. And a point four would have been a lot of boron. And it's these patterns that tell us about the evolution of this vein and how this vein actually came to be. And I'll give you a moment to just marvel on this rock about the crisscrossing of the veins through this rock. And what you are looking at here is at least three parts of geologic history because the rock was deposited, the rock was altered, fractured, and then these veins would have been in place. So each of these rocks tells a story in itself. And now I am coming to the next step. I am coming to the SAM instrument. It's one of the uh, instruments in the rover belly. And um, what you see here is an instrument that takes in sample through these sample inlets or actually through the air inlets here, the atmospheric inlets, and measures gases. If it takes in the rock, they drop it to an oven and are heated to release the gases. Uh, if you take the atmosphere, you can process it in here, but you can then measure the gases, no matter whether they came out of the rock or are they, if they are atmosphere, uh, with a gas chromatograph and the tunable laser spectrometer. I don't have the time to go into all of those details, so I will uh, focus on results of the tunable laser spectrometer because that's what made the big headlines, because we found methane, right? And methane, that's cows. This is, by, by the way, a picture uh, of a longhorn in Texas with a NASA big rocket um, museum in the back. If I say methane is cows uh, and say this a little snarky snippy, 
uh, methane isn't produced by the cow itself. Methane is produced by the microbes in the cow's stomach and guts. So it is anaerobic microbes that take advantage of the environment within the cow that then help the cow digest its food, living on what they are doing there and emitting the methane. So that's the process here. And uh, inorganic environment, uh, anaerobic environments are very important uh, on Mars as well, because we have the CO2 atmosphere and uh, barely uh, no oxygen, any oxygen. I'm a bit distracted. There is a storm going on here that pounds down on my window. Sorry. Right. How much methane do we have? Uh, we knew that there was met methane on Mars before Curiosity arrived. And so uh, look at this table. If I were in the room with you, you would now stare at this like, oh, my God, a slide full of numbers and words. And what is she doing here? Has she ever learned about uh, giving a talk? Yes, she has, because I'm not going to give you a test. I'm just pointing out the two end members. They say 45 PPBV, parts per billion per volume. So in any volume unit that has 1 billion parts, there is one part of methane. And it ranges from 45 to 3 before curiosity. So what did we do? Well, our first paper was in 2014, where we had a baseline and we had some daytime measurements. The measurements are higher at daytime. And we had measurements down here at about 2 PPB per volume. And we had measurements up here at about 6 ppb, 7 ppb per volume. You see different error bars, those of you who are used to dealing with data. These are just direct ingest and measured. We can also enrich the methane by doing several ingestions and getting rid of the atmospheric CO2. If you do that, the error bars get a lot smaller, but it is a very costly measurement. We've done them repeatedly, but you need to stop and measure for a lot longer. And so to get some good spread, of data, we are doing the easier measurements more frequently. So here you are, that was in 2014. And that's what we found as the baseline, about 0.7 parts per billion per volume. And that's what we found is the peaks, it's 7 point something parts per billion per volume. So um, that's where we were and where we then started to make very regular measurements. And here is what we had uh, as per mid of last year. You see the Martian atmospheric pressure curve in the background and you see uh, the blue dots are the first ones uh, that we had in the first Martian year. The yellow is the second Martian year and the red is the uh, third Martian year. And you remember a Martian year is uh, about double the length than an Earth year. So they follow the seasons, but occasionally you have these spikes. And most recently in July last year, we had a spike of about 20 parts per billion per volume. And so this was above all blank levels. And while there was quite a debate about the measurements down here, whether they could have been in any way not real, there is absolutely no question that these are real. So there is methane on Mars and uh, we, as the team believe they are all real, but there was a heated debate that I don't want to gloss over. I think it's absolutely clear there is methane on Mars. And the question is, why is it so variable? Why does it follow the seasons? Why do we even more importantly see these spikes? And this is a slide that I also have from NASA because it shows really, really well what the different sources and sinks might be. And so let me start underground at my most favorite place, and that's down here. Uh, olivine, I mentioned it earlier, a mineral. If you weather this uh, with water, you will get, get generate hydrogen. And so in an environment where there is also carbon, this hydrogen from the rock weathering can form and will form methane. It's a well-known process on Earth. We know there is. Uh, olivine on Mars, we know there is water on Mars, we know there is warmth on Mars in the depth to make these reactions happen. So this reaction is something that will inevitably produce methane on Mars. So we have one source of which we know it's there, we have all the ingredients. And so to me, that's the baseline how methane on Mars is formed by water rock reactions. And so you have your methane. 
but on the left, there is, of course, the other option. I talked about the cows and the anaerobic environments. We have a lot of CO2. We have an anaerobic environment. So if there ever had been anaerobic methanogenic microbes, they could have produced methane as well. But that all would have been way back in the Noachian uh, 4.5 billion to 4.2 billion years ago. And so how, why do we measure this now, 4 billion years later? Well, the methane might not have lasted that long unless it was stored, because other, uh, if it wasn't stored, it would have been in the atmosphere and got destroyed there. So processes could be sealing units like on Earth, where you have the hydrocarbon traps, or clathrates. Clathrates are special ices that can trap methane. And then you could release them at any time, either through a Mars quake, or if you actually heat the place a little bit, for example, uh, because uh, of the sun angle, and it is a summer season. Now, if you look at this, once the methane is out here, there is another way of producing methane, and that is if you have organics on the surface. And meteorites will bring organics. You all know, probably from previous talks, you have heard that there are organics of inorganic production, like non-biologic production, I should say, in the solar system. If, they, if meteorites brought them uh, onto the surface, they could be degrading and go to methane. So we have three potential sources, two of which we know are there, and that's the surface organics, and that's the olivine. The other one is rather speculative. So we have the UV, which might produce some methane, but would also destroy the methane by photochemistry into other organic substances and eventually carbon dioxide. And if the, as the Martian atmosphere is 96% carbon dioxide, if you add something to that, a little bit to that, you will never, ever find it again. And uh, so the, the balance between getting new methane produced and having it destroyed is very important because that's how we can finally understand the methane cycle. And there are still quite a few unknowns. And uh, Stephen Lewis, for example, at the, university, at the Open University, he does atmospheric modeling to see how the winds and the turnover rates in the atmosphere work. There are people looking at this environment uh, of uh, irradiation. I am personally looking at the water rock reactions and what are the amounts of methane that could come out there. And of course, my colleagues of astrobiology or you look at the methanogens and how much they could produce and where they could live. So all of this is a matter of active research at this moment. So now let me show you a few just nice pictures to have a bit of a relief here. So this is Martian dust storm season. We had, uh, when we were parked at the Duluth drill hole um, a while ago, actually now, we had a massive global dust storm come through. The left picture was taken before the dust storm. The right picture was taken during the dust storm. And you see how much more opaque and how much more red this image looks. And you see how this little hill that we produced by drilling erodes away. But I find the difference uh, in lightning conditions between these two images most striking. Then next here, um, we find crazy things occasionally, or not so crazy, expected, because we know it happened on Earth, so why shouldn't it happen on Mars? Shiny things that stick out from the entire surrounding because they look like a piece of metal. And well, they are. And at this point, I want to give a shout to the Mars uh, Science Laboratory website. You see the mars.nasa.gov here. We have mission updates where you can follow each planning day on these mission updates. And one of us will always write a mission update at the end of a planning day and tell you what actually has happened um, and what measurements will the rover do uh, while we are all sleeping here on Earth and before the next planning. And yes, here is, by the way, the rock in a plain view. That's egg rock. This is um, little colonse. So meteorites on Mars, iron meteorites on Mars are uh, happening. And uh, the Mer rovers found them. We found them. And it's always interesting to see what they are. But we don't spend much time on them because we have them here on Earth. So we look what they are. And then we could investigate with our terrestrial instruments and wouldn't need to use rover time. Uh, as long as we know what they are, we can compare them to what the, those in our collections. And now, 
Finally, here we are. This is one of my last slides uh, of the Curiosity mission. What you see here is the traverse, this white line that goes all the way through the picture. This is where we came from uh, down here in the brown unit through the green unit. We had a very quick climb on what's the this turquoise unit, the green hoop pediment. And we are now sitting down here out there in the clay bearing unit. We no, actually, somewhere there. We will be going out here where the contact to the sulfate bearing unit is and then drive along this contact and, and investigate this contact because the sulfate bearing unit would be the next unit in terms of how scarce is water. Clay bearing units are deposited with, fair, with a fair amount of water. The sulfate bearing unit it would indicate less water. So we are interested in this transition zone. And then maybe climb on the green herb pediment and go up the hill. We, we might not get any further. Uh, the mission is uh, eight years in. So we have come a long way. I'm confident we go a long way. But at this moment, uh, we are ramping up for another drill. Uh, if you read the blog, we've uh, found a place and we will be looking at drilling one last drill hole in the clay bearing unit. This is the postcard from Mars, uh, the traverse again down here. Uh, you see the little excursions. And uh, this is the Murray Formation, where we came from, hematite rich, now Vera Rubin rich, the clay and the sulfate unit. I love this postcard view. And this is the current parking position of the rover, taking from the hazard avoidance front camera. Uh, so you see the wheels on the side here, and you see a bit of hardware, the arm up here, a joint up here. This is the current parking position on Sol 2831, and we are still at that point. This ends the curiosity talk, and I will just give a shout out, I already said, the United Arab Emirates Hope Orbiter is on its way. Uh, it launched a couple of days ago. I watched it live and I was really excited to see it go from Japan. Here you are, it's an atmospheric investigator and it was the instruments were, and the orbit were carefully selected to add to the Trace Guards Orbiter from ESA and the MAVEN instruments, uh, the MAVEN Orbiter from NASA and add information about the atmosphere, water, uh, oxygen and all the uh, important elements to talk about the evolution of the Martian atmosphere. There's China. They went two days ago. Uh, I don't know much about that rover. Um, I haven't found anything, so I'm uh, uh, banking on a press release picture here, but they went apparently successful and good luck to them as well. They will also arrive in February, like the UAA mission and like hopefully uh, the Perseverance rover. Perseverance is a rover built on the chassis of Curiosity. It has, uh, of course, also mast cameras and navigation cameras. You actually see the hazard cameras very well in this image. And it has an arm, but it has different instruments on it. And uh, I do this very quickly because uh, I'm just a fan. I'm not on this mission. So we also have a weather station. We have SuperCam, which is the ChemCam instrument, but with added spectral capabilities. We have Sherlock and Watson, we have Pixel, which is all chemistry and mineralogy instruments. Um, we have subsurface radar. So this time we are not looking for water and chlorine, but we are looking for the structure of the underground. And um, we have MOXIE. And Mo I said in the very beginning, RAT, the radiation assessment detector, is doing preparations for humans to Mars. MOXIE is an oxygen production demonstrator. So they are actually not um, contributing to the science of the mission in terms of the geology, but what they are doing is they are turning Martian CO2 into oxygen and measuring how, how efficiently and how cleanly they can do it. And so if you want to follow them, which I assume you all will, right? Um, this was the countdown yesterday. So it is going about uh, just after lunch on the 30th and watch that countdown clock. It is at nasa.gov Mars 2020. Um, watch that countdown clock, see if they are facing any weather delays. It's Florida after all, but fingers crossed to them. And I hope we, we have in February, three new more missions around Mars and it will be super, super exciting. And with that, I'll shut up and take questions. Thank you very much. 
Fantastic. Thank you very much, Suzanne. Uh, I wonder if we have the possibility to do applauses on this, but I don't know. word for it. <laughs> <laughs> so we have some questions. Um, so uh, 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 Jack Martin has asked a couple. Uh, uh, how long is the life expectancy of Curiosity? You mentioned we're eight years in. How long we got? Well, uh, that's about, it's if I ask someone, when, when are you going to die? Of course, uh, a rover has a shelf life and uh, you might have seen, we don't have solar panels, but uh, so the story around the Mars uh, exploration rovers, which outlived any warranty of 90 days by a decade uh, and more, uh, isn't this story isn't quite possible because we have a radioactive power source. And so it's modeled that for 14, one, four years, the energy levels are good enough to do what we are currently doing. And so if all goes well, uh, I think we have quite a few more years to come. Of course, with any spacecraft uh, on any uh, other planet, you can't send the service truck. So there are uh, always questions, but I am very confident all instruments are in good shape, uh, all wheels, everything. We have a couple holes in the wheels, but we know how to manage that and it's it's in good shape. So it's, I would think, a lady at her middle age. <laughs> That's a really good answer. So uh, another question was, uh, 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 how many and what types of battery power curious? You mentioned these radioisotope generators. It's just a lump of warm rock and it's warm because it's radioactive? Uh, no, it's it's actually generating energy and I would need a physicist's help here to <laughs> explain all the details. So you, you generate the, um, the radioactive power source generates a constant supply of power and okay. that then gets fed into the batteries. So we have, a, have the batteries full when we start our operations and actually managing that battery power is, is one of the biggest issues every planning day because I, as a geologist, I want to do everything, but there isn't just energy enough for that. It's energy and the bandwidth um, that is always in critical supply to get the data back to Earth. So what you need to do is you need to, uh, you have this constant feed of, of power from the radioactive power source and you have to look up the numbers. They are on the uh, fact sheet. I don't have them on top of my head. Um, so they are fed into the batteries and they charge the batteries. And what we do is we use this energy for our science investigations. And when the battery status gets low, we either take a nap or we need to stop for the day and let the rover sleep overnight. So it's pretty much like uh, human beings live. You, you, you do a few things, then you recharge your batteries and then you do a few more things. And uh, we maximize this. We do uh, take a lot of care to make sure to switch everything off as, as soon as we can switch it off. Uh, we make sure to operate at the right time of the day. Mars gets very cold at night, so you need to heat a lot more when you uh, operate in the cold period. So it is an optimizing procedure all the time. Um, and uh, instruments such as a SAM instrument, if you heat a rock to 900 degrees Celsius, that takes a lot of energy. A simple image takes a lot less energy. However, that number that SAM gets, it takes a lot less data volume than that image that the camera gets. So there is always balancing going on on the resources. Wow, I had no idea that the energy management was such a such an involved process. Gosh, it's oh. one of the critical things when we do planning mm. to manage our energy, to manage our data volume and actually to manage complexity. Complexity mm. is what can a human being safely security and uh, without making mistakes achieve in a given amount of time? Because you get your data and when you come in in the morning, you are faced with a new situation. And now you have to plan in a new situation. You can do some preparation. You can say, assuming this has all gone well, what are we going to do? And then you plan and we do this pre-planning at the end of every planning day. However, you are faced with a new situation. You have to, for example, when you stop and want to move your arm, assess, is actually this safe? Is my rover sitting on safe ground? You can't predict that. There could be a tiny little rock that it has perched one uh, wheel on. And if this is a front wheel, it's not safe to extend a weight forward because it might just dip and you might uh, hit, hit something with your arm that you 
have close to the ground. So you need to look at all these things in real time. And so complexity is a question of what can someone actually achieve safely and without mistakes in a given time? And I give a shout out to Emily Lactavala, who has written a book on all how this all works. And she describes all of these things real well. Ah, she's very, yes, yes. Yeah, she's, she's great. She's a great science communicator. Uh, there's another question here from uh, Jan Drozd. Uh, how much surface water was there at maximum? Are we talking? about oceans or are we talking about much less? Yes, we could be talking about oceans and we are oh. likely talking about oceans. So uh, Mars would have had a much thicker atmosphere uh, 2 point, uh, 4.2 billion years and earlier ago. And so in Gale Crater and in other craters as well, you can see this on these orbital images, you have a lake that, uh, that filled this crater about half height. And that's a lot of water. I mean, this is a 150 kilometer diameter crater. And so if you fill this half height, that's already a lot of water. But we also know from the investigation of the northern lowlands that there are shorelines. Clifford and Parker have looked at them and have uh, carefully traced around the northern lowlands. So we would have had a northern ocean. And isotopic studies of hydrogen have shown that um, the atmosphere has changed in a way which makes it actually very likely that we, in the very early history, had an ocean on Mars and all these craters would have been filled um, and we would have had stream beds and uh, colleagues, uh, the group of Matt Balm at the Open University and many colleagues around the world, they are studying images and looking at the stream beds that uh, this water rich period has left. So we had an active hydrologic system or a global hydrologic system. Wow, that's really strange to think of. Um, there's a, a question here from Andrew Coates. How old are the rocks? Are the rocks visited by curiosity getting younger and younger as the rover gets higher on Mount Sharp? From a geological perspective, yes, they would be. We have potassium argon uh, dating, and so Ken Farley and his group did that, where they did dating of Two, on two places of our rocks. And if you do this, you put the rock into the SAM instrument and you heat it. And if you do heat it to two different steps, so you heat it, say, to the halfway point, you get the gases that come from minerals such as the sulfates that are easier to degas, that are at a lower temperature give off their volatiles. And uh, we found that in these gases, we get an age of about 2.6 billion years ago. So a fairly young age actually for Martian rocks because the main part of the rock, the crystalline part of the rock is 4.2 billion years old. And that coincides with what we got from the crater counting uh, as the age of this area and region. So we have these two ages, which might bracket the ages that we find in Gale Crater. And that would be the absolute ages. Of course, there are huge error bars because um, you are measuring two different elements. You're measuring the potassium, which is the radioactive daughter, and the argon, which is uh, the product, uh, the radioactive parent, sorry, and the, the argon, which is the daughter. And then you have, uh, you, you have to make assessments how much argon is from the atmosphere in all of this. And so it is a very complex data reduction procedure. But we are fairly confident because the um, older age coincides with the age that we get from crater counting. So if you look at an area uh, with a surface that doesn't have major tectonic overhaul, like uh, all the surfaces on Earth, impacts would have accumulated over time. And by counting the impacts and grouping them by size, you can actually discern the surface age. And this is calibrated against uh, the Apollo samples that we have and the lunar crater count. And so what you can do there is you can actually find out how old is the surface. And since the, the impact and, and all of this would probably have reset the ages, the uh, agreement between the age that we measured and the age of the surface tells us that this is actually a fairly solid assumption. It's 4.2 billion. And 
then you can look at the relative ages. I said in the beginning that you start out with the oldest rocks and then you go up and up and you get younger. How much younger and what's the time in there is something that I can't answer yet and that we are trying to figure out. Oh, wow, okay, interesting, interesting. So there's a question uh, from YouTube. Um, uh, why not test for life? Instead of taking photos, test for life. Why are we... Well, why are we not doing that? Well, testing for life, you need to know what the geochemical background is. Okay. And I'm now going back to 1976 to the Viking mission. They had a very sophisticated and very intelligent instrument and experimental setup to figure out is there life on Mars. So what they did, they fed some of the soil to a nutrient in the rover and that nutrient had labeled isotopes and if um, microbes would eat it, they would give off gases and the gases would have this labeled uh, isotope in it and so you would know something lives there and eats my nutrient. However, there was a spike of this labeled isotope release, but it wasn't as you would expect, because if you would expect microbes in this little vessel, you would expect to slowly see a peak and then the, my, my, the microbes gobble up the nutrients and it fades off again. But what they saw instead is they put it in and they saw a very sharp rise. We now know that there is the chemical element perchlorate, which would destroy the nutrient and this way release the isotope. So this is one argument why you really need to know what's there. And plus, what we likely will find here is not life in the sense of something runs from right to left in front of our camera, but instead what we find is the traces of life that once was there. That's biomarkers. And biomarkers is something that is really hard to interpret. Let me go back to the methane. Methane is a biomarker because biologic activity can produce methane. However, in doing so, we also know there are other processes, the olivine, the water rock reaction that produces methane. To distinguish the one from the other, you need to have other biomarkers that agree with your first finding. So you first need to understand the environment. You need to understand who is it who could have lived there and what type of biomarkers would they actually have left and are they distinguishable, unambiguously distinguishable from what is actually the inorganic background. Can you make something inorganically through a water rock reaction? Can you make a set of observations inorganically that it is not a biomarker? And yes, it might be one, but you cannot claim it because an extraordinary claim such as we found life on Mars needs extraordinary evidence. You need to be absolutely sure. And that's why we try to understand first what's there. And the next rovers, of course, will all go one step further. They will have different instruments and they will build on what we have learned to now. And they will take this further. And they will also cage some samples to bring them back so we can investigate them here on Earth with all the technology we have here on Earth. So that um, actually brings me to a couple of questions that have been uh, posted. One is uh, that it's worth mentioning that the ESA Russian Rosalind Franklin uh, rover, ExoMars 2022 rover, it'll be drilling up to two meters, uh, getting below the ultraviolet and the oxidation and the radiation. And then there was another question, well there was a, that was a comment rather than a question, but there was another question, uh, is there any collaboration between the European Space Agency and NASA in sharing the goals of their projects? There is, yes. Um, so this is a very, very important comment. And I haven't talked much about the Rosalind Franklin rover, simply because I was told it is not acceptable to talk until midnight. <laughs> so uh, if I wanted to talk about everything that I wanted to talk about, uh, I could have been here forever. So uh, the Rosalind Franklin rover, I'll happily come back and talk about her about her when uh, she's actually going, uh, because it's a fascinating uh, instrument in itself. 
uh, and it will also look at the with the radar at the subsurface and in this case also for safety reasons because as the Cohen said it's going to drill down two meters and the reason is I said uh, the surface is harsh you saw the UV in my methane slide and so everything we find at the surface in our little six centimeter deep drill on the Curiosity rover is actually modified by this irradiation and what we found is the organics are mostly when they are complex and ring or uh, bearing organics they are actually sulfur bearing and we think the sulfur uh, stabilizes these structures and whether this is an original signature or something where a selection happened because those with sulfur just survived and the others we don't see anymore we can't tell the Rosalind Franklin Nova is going to get rid of all of these problems by drilling into an area where the irradiation will not have been anymore. And with that, you have the advantage to get a more pristine sample. Yeah. And, and, and that's that's the great thing. And I'm, I'm truly looking forward to this. And yes, collaboration is always on the cards. Um, take curiosity. The um, weather station is built in Spain. The ChemChem -chem instrument is built half in America and half in France. Uh, the Dan instrument is Russian. Uh, I am a German working in Britain, being on the team. <laughs> so there is a lot of collaboration. NASA also um, makes the data proprietary for only six months. So as a team member, if I didn't get to do the work in the first six months, every, it's fair game for everyone. And I'm competing against everyone because after six months, the data are put on the da planetary data system and everyone, you don't even have to be a scientist and enrolled at a university or something. Everyone who listens to me today can go to the planetary data system and download everything that any NASA mission has ever been done. Um, and they are getting historic data that weren't online like data are now uh, into that system as well. So it's open, it, everyone can see it. Um, with ESA as well, there is collaboration for the Perseverance rover. There are Europeans on the mission. There are also is a mix of instruments. And for the United Arab Emirates mission, that was a collaboration with America as well. And there was careful selection of instruments to add to what is already being done. We've been working with the trace gas orbiter. So the European trace gas orbiter has looked down on Curiosity and made a measurement at the same time that we ingested atmosphere. Uh, we is then the NASA rover, right? Um, and so we getting out there just blurs terrestrial boundaries and we are all working together. It's one of the, the really the nicest things I find in science is how international and collaborative it is. It yes. really is. Yes. So there was a question, uh, how, how much has this mission achieved that Beagle 2 was unable to do? That's a hard mm. comparison mm. because Beagle 2 would have gone to a very different place with very different objectives. Beagle 2 had a mole, so Beagle 2 would have drilled deeper than what we can drill, right? Mm. But because we are a rover, we cover a much larger area. So comparing a rover and a lander is a very complex thing. But let me give this that spin. Beagle 2 had a very complex mass spectrometer. So it was probably most comparable to the SAM instrument. So the organic measurements, the idea of looking for the organics and biomarkers in that sense is what we are currently doing and what Beagle would have done. Of course, Beagle would also have gotten pictures of its entire surrounding. And so there is a big overlap, but then also remember we drove 25 kilometers on Mars. So all of this would have added to our understanding of Mars. There is never competition if you, if you only can, investigate these small areas you always add to what the other one does you never take away from them indeed indeed so speaking of um going uh driving for 25 kilometers someone's asked um oh john morrell has asked there seem to be quite a few meteorites found compared to what would be expected for a similar length of traverse on earth is it because the, the is the flux greater or do they just show up better or do they last longer because of lack of water I think it's the latter. It's they last quite long uh, because and it's how you find them. 
if we go for meteorites and look for meteorites, we go to either the deserts or we go to uh, the uh, to Antarctica on the ice sheet because it's how does a meteorite distinguish itself from the environment? First of all, you are totally right. There is a lack of water, like there would be in a desert in like the Atacama Desert or the um, North African deserts. There is a lack of water, so these iron meteorites don't rust. If it um, were falling in Britain today, and I just earlier made a remark how the pounding down of rain distracted me, uh, it wouldn't last very long. It would just weather away and that would be it. Uh, so you either see it fall and you retrieve it or you might never find it. But if you go to a desert on earth, you see them lying around there. They get If they are stones, they get very shiny surfaces. If they are metals, you see the, this, the metal surface and you can pick them up from the surface because they are lying there and not weathering away. The same uh, holds for Antarctica where you are on these blue ice shields uh, and you go to the blue ice shields because there isn't a greater flux. What happens on Antarctica is you distribute them evenly about the uh, ice sheet and then the ice is, uh, collect, is pressed against the mountains, it goes up, the ice sublimes away, and the meteorites, of course, they don't sublime away, so they keep on the surface of the ice sheet, and that's why there are so many of them. And so these, it's, it's a question of, um, it's preserved better, it sticks out, and I don't know if we really have more than we have on Earth, uh, because we found about 10 so far, the Murrow was found, I think, uh, on the order of 20. Christian Schroeder from Sterling wrote a nice paper about that. And uh, they are interesting. Another question is the atmosphere. Uh, how little one, can you get very small ones through because they would burn up in the Earth's atmosphere. So there are slight differences, but the flux rate is the same in the inner solar system, or it has always been. The flux rate over time has varied, but it's the same in the, in the solar system, just varied by the gravity of the body. Wow. So um, uh, speaking of the water, there's um, uh, a couple of questions on water. So how much of the original maximum water is still present subsurface and uh, as ice at the poles? And also someone's asking, uh, 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 so Tony is asking, you mentioned climate change, ending the wet and dry cycles. What caused this climate change on Mars? So um, the cause of climate change on Mars, take, let me take this first. Uh, there is a deb debate um, how this happened, and there are two processes um, that both contributed to it. The one is if you make a really big basin-sized impact, you blast away some of the atmosphere. So if you look at a, Mar a map of Mars, there are basins such as Hellas and Argyre, uh, Crise, Utopia, these, these very big basins. If a meteorite, if a very big meteor hits a planet, it will not only eject rocks and deposit them on the surface, it will also eject the atmosphere. The other part is Mars is smaller than Earth, so its gravity is lower. And so the effects of atmospheric loss by uh, just gases getting lost at the top of the atmosphere is bigger. And we see a mixture of both. The way you do this is you look at the isotopes. And if you look at the, if the isotopes are what they originally should have been, and the atmosphere is just thinner, then that speaks for something just getting blasted off. But if something gets lost, then the lighter ones will get lost preferentially because they get held down less than the heavier ones. And so you have that balance of um, getting lost for the lighter ones um, more than the heavier ones and you get an, a shift in the isotopic ratio and we observe both and you might want to look into things like the maven orbiter they are investigating this at the moment i am not exactly an expert in it although i study noble gases a little and you can see it in the noble gases that there was uh, this continuous loss as well as loss to it through an impactor mm. and what was the question about Good water one. Where, where the water is. Yeah. So uh, some of it might have, it will have been lost with this because there is also this oxidation process. And uh, when water gets split into oxygen and uh, hydrogen, the hydrogen will get lost. And so there is some loss. 
and uh, we don't know exactly how much uh, water is everywhere because we don't know how much is in the underground. Mars is a planet with a geothermal gradient, so it gets water by about uh, warmer by about 13 degrees per kilometer as you go down. That's an average number to give you a comparison on Earth. That's about 30 degrees per kilometer. So if you, for example, in South Africa, go down these very deep gold mines, it's really hot down there at three kilometer depth. Um, and so there is that. So there might be liquid water or actually will be liquid water in the underground someplace, we assume. And it's Steve Clifford and Jeremy Lasso, the work of, of these uh, colleagues who look into these things. And, and then you have the ice caps, rightly so, which are mostly water ice, but also some CO2 ice. And there is ground ice as well, uh, if in the, especially in the northern latitudes and the very southern latitudes, if you get small craters hitting the dust, uh, you see some uh, ice that then sublimes away. The Phoenix mission, which landed in the, um, in the pole, uh, that also did, dug and found a bit of ice under the uh, upper surface dust layer. There is evidence, again, from from surface observations that there have been glaciers buried under um, dust and, and rock layers. And so, yes, there is a fair bit of evidence, but um, the numbers vary uh, what you would uh, call a global equivalent layer um, in me measured in meters or kilometers, they vary. And I don't want to put any number out here and favor anyone. It's not my area of research, but there is a fair bit of water right, is still on Mars. Wow, that's that's really interesting for a place that looks so dry. Um, I've got two final questions, uh, and before we should move on, I think to uh, Robin's uh, short talk. Um, one question is: Do the um, unexpected increases in methane occur at the same time of the Martian year? And the other question is: On your final thank you slide, you got those uh, rounded rocks. Have they been rounded by water? Uh, okay. Um... What was the first one? The first one is, um, uh, do the unexpected increases in methane occur at the same time of the Martian year? No, they didn't. Uh, close enough, but they didn't. And we, uh, we, we found two, but also we don't know the statistics of them yet. We found two and they were unexpected and they were there and gone again. So we, we are looking out for them. And I, until we have found a few more of them, I don't think we can put any patterns on them. So far, we've got two of the really high ones, and I don't want to say anything about when and where they occur, but simply because I don't have the statistics. Astronomers know all about statistics, don't they? All the time, yes. So, and uh, what I'm showing here is Dingo Gap, and uh, these rocks are likely weathered by heat in the place where they are, because what you are looking at here is a landscape that um, has this little dune that we drove over, and I just love this picture because you don't see where we came from and we just drove above the, across the dune and off we went. You see in the very lower right uh, edge, you see the, the corner of the rover. What, what likely happened here is that this were are very homogeneous, very um, evenly grained rocks. And so if they get heated and cooled by the sun and the temperature differences are a lot uh, ex more extreme, here than they would be in Britain because you have this thin atmosphere, you have the sun coming down during daytime on the rock, heating this black piece of rock, really warm. You all know how hot your car gets uh, in summer when the sun go, go, like, um, hits uh, on the black uh, plastic. And then it cools down to maybe minus 20, minus 50, depending on the season at night. And so with that, because that process comes in and out from uh, radially from the surface, you get this peeling off the layers. If you ever are as lucky as I am and get to the Atacama Desert, it, there you see that as well, This, this these rounded almost onion shells that fall off these rocks. And that's what it is here. Uh, they are also too big for water in this area. Uh, but this is how the how they happen. That's that's wow. That's that's really interesting. I did, I, you know, I must say I'm just amazed. I've never thought I'd be alive at a time where you, where we'd be seeing rounded pebbles from uh, streams on Mars. <laughs> My goodness, and sedimentary rocks just all stacked up. Oh wow, it's just amazing. It really is. 
So I've got, uh, there have been lots and lots of uh, people put, uh, putting on the chat saying fabulous talk, many thanks. Um, most interesting and exhilarating, appreciating the, ge the chemistry and the geology and uh, th thank you for all, all the great efforts. So, um, so, so thank you all for coming. I mean, uh, it is great to have you all here online and I hope we can repeat this one day in a lecture hall. Many thanks for coming and your time. Thanks very much. Well, take care, Suzanne. So I'll stop sharing now and uh, Robin is taking over. Is that right? The next thing is for Robin to give a talk, um, okay. but Robin has just disappeared. So I, I'm not quite sure where Robin has gone to. Right. Um, so if you have any more questions or anything, I'm happy to see if he shows up again. Maybe there he is coming back. <laughs> Hello. So, oh, hi. My uh, my computer just collapsed on me just as Suzanne was, was uh, coming to an end, and I had to restart it. What a thing to happen! Oh, oh my days, goodness! Uh, so much for technology, eh? Yes, it's happened once before during a Zoom meeting. I hope it doesn't make a habit of it. I just got a, 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 a sort of whirring noise in my ears, and so uh, yeah, you. I really enjoyed Suzanne's talk. That was superb. Now you want me to do something, don't you? Yes, please. You yes, right. I, I shall have to uh, just give me a second while I uh, find the, the, uh, the, the presentation I was going to give, which won't take long, but uh, bear with me, please, uh, because the computer just had to restart itself. Um, now, meeting talks, here we go. I've, what I'm going to talk about is just show you a few pictures of the, of the comet, hopefully. I found the presentation. Let's just get it started up. And uh, well, I'm afraid if you haven't seen the comet already uh, and looking outside, as Suzanne said, pouring rain out here, but uh, hopefully it won't be uh, there forever and we will be able to get to see the comet again. If you haven't seen it already, don't delay too long. It's really quite easy to find at the moment right underneath the uh, uh, underneath the plough there. But um, uh, I've got to, uh, unfortunately I was doing recording on my, uh, uh, dear, um, I shall have to worry about the recording of the meeting afterwards. Uh, it seems that that was cancelled when my, uh, when my computer went down. Uh, let me now um, try and share my screen. Someone has just said that they did see, uh, see it twice this week through binoculars and it looks marvellous. Share screen. There we go. Right now, this is PowerPoint slideshow. I think this is the one I want to share. Yay! I think so. And hopefully, you can see the sign saying "Comet Tales" and other matters. And can you see my first slide there? Yep. Good. Right. Okay. This was one of our first views of the of the comet on the seventh of July. Well, seventh eighth. I'm not sure if it was before or after midnight. A lot of these have got double dates because, of course, the comet was visible over a period of uh, uh, over overnight and uh, sometimes uh, the date changes if it's just a minute to midnight or a minute after midnight. That's what uh, Paul down in uh, Kent saw of the comet rising over the sea there. It was um, in the in the northern sky. I think he had to get up about three in the morning to see that in the twilight sky. And you'll notice there the very interesting appearance of a sort of shadow in the middle of the comet's tail. Now, I've been trying to establish just what causes this shadow. It looks as if it's the shadow of the nucleus on the tail, but that can't be right because the nucleus of a comet is only really quite tiny. It's maybe a few kilometres across, no more than 10 kilometres across. Whereas there, the, the actual shadow that you can see there is absolutely... Uh, well, must be thousands of miles wide. So that's not the really the shadow of the nucleus. Uh, Jonathan Shanklin, the, um, who is a great expert on comets, said that it was a bit like the appearance of a planetary nebula. No, you know how you see the ring of the planetary nebula, whereas in fact it's a shell of gas and it's just the optical depth of the outer side of the, the tail being greater. Uh, and that is what causes the, the shadow effect. But funny enough, that disappeared after a few days. Um, this was a picture I took on uh, a couple of nights later. I really love this picture because it gives an appearance of the, the comet uh, with a nice uh, foreground. And if you show that picture to people who haven't seen the comet, they might think, wow, that's, that's really massive. But of course, that was taken with a 
200 millimeter telephoto, telephoto lens and it gives a slightly misleading impression and anybody who has not seen a comet will think that that was just dashing through the sky i saw a film last christmas on tv a very silly film i've got to say i don't know why i spent my time watching it but it re referring to a christmas comet and they saw this christmas comet and it just zoomed across the sky as we know comets don't actually do that but you can understand why um, why people might think seeing a picture like that and here's a lovely picture from Gillian Rushforth in Huntington, one of our members. And that same night, the uh, uh, when I took that last photograph on the 11th of July, uh, in, that's in the early morning, we had this wonderful sight of the noctilucent cloud, which you can see down there on the left. Look like cirrus clouds, but they are not cirrus clouds. They're very much higher in our atmosphere. And it was, um, I don't think we've, we've ever had that appearance before. I can't remember ever seeing a comet and uh, and uh, a noctilucent cloud together before, <clears throat> and here's a close up of that uh, same event from Keith Mosley in Monmouth, and uh, absolutely beautiful sight. Now this is a great shot from um, Dave Eagle in Northamptonshire and uh, at Rawns near Wellingborough, <clears throat> and this shows you the appearance in the peer, uh, changes in the appearance of the comet from the tenth when it had that shadow in the middle and. Then that's almost gone on the 12th. And on the 14th, it's again, it's there are changes. And by the 17th, if you look carefully at, uh, well, people call it the, the nucleus, it's a pseudo nucleus, you can see a slight greenish tinge there. Now, I haven't got time to go into all the details, nor am I a great expert on comets, but I'm sure everyone watching knows that there are two tails of comets, there's the dust tail, which is what we mostly see there, which is the uh, the, the yellow, uh, the, the whitish yellowish uh, dust, which has been released from the comet's head uh, from the nucleus, and it goes into orbit around the sun, and uh, therefore it's often slightly curved. It doesn't really point directly in the away from the sun, but it is often curved. And you can see on the photograph at the, uh, of the 17th, if I just point out with the, the mouth, just here there's an indication of a sort of, um, a, a so, sort of a fluting effect, which is caused by dust being um, given off at different times. Um, and uh, that, that goes into separate orbits around the sun. So a particularly large bulk of dust given at a certain time goes into its own orbit around the sun. And that gives, and then there's some of the very close, uh, very detailed photographs, you can see a lot of those. So that's a very graphic in, in indication of the way the comets change. But in addition, we've got this green color to explain. And we've got the, the, the ion tail, the, the gas tail. The, the gas tail is the first to appear. It consists of uh, ionized plasma gas, which uh, is uh, particularly the carbon monoxide, which is the most easily ionized gas in the comet's head. And that is driven off more or less directly away from the sun by the solar wind. But there are other molecules which uh, start to uh, to uh, fluoresce in the head of the comet. And those are things like, uh, you, you get all these things like hydrogen cyanide, um, cyanogen, uh, you get uh, various, all, all the all the heavier, all the, the very common things which are th very present throughout the solar system, you get various combinations of hydrogen, oxygen, nitrogen, and carbon. And those form complex molecules which start to fluoresce green. And that is the reason for the green appearance of the head. And here's one which I took uh, just uh, what, five days, four days ago. And you can see that that green appearance of the head is very obvious now. Isn't it a little, what looks like a green blob just to the right of the comet? It's not a fragment of the comet's head. It was actually a star which is right behind the, uh, the, the coma of the comet there. So and as I took this photograph, I took several photographs over a period of half an hour and it, you can see that star moving, apparently moving, or rather the comet moving in front of it. And it started out on one side of the comet's nucleus and crossed over to the other side. So very graphic illustration of the way the, 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 the comet moved. And that was a close up taken with a, a 2000 millimeter focal length telescope. So that's the last photograph that I've, I've been sent actually, I took, it, took it myself, of the appearance of the comet. Where would you find the comet? Here's a, a, a slide of where to look for it in the next few nights. You can see everyone recognizes the plough over in the northern or rather the northwestern part of the sky. And it is now 
well, take the two left-hand stars off the bowl of the plough and project them downwards, and that's where the comet should be. You, you won't need to find the chart, just look with binoculars. Whether it's naked eye depends on how good your skies are at the moment, but it should still be visible with the naked eye. Its magnitude at the moment is about 3.5, and as it goes more to the uh, more into August, it will fade down to about magnitude 4. Definitely a binocular sight. Whether you'll see it with the naked eye depends on your skies and how dark the sky is at the time, but also definitely a photographic object. So uh, try and get some photographs of that. Its appearance is changing all the time and should be visible to binoculars and telescopes and cameras for some time to come. Well worth a look and have a look as soon as you can, skies permitting. Uh, finally, here's well. Here's a picture of the uh, the graph that has been. I, I got this this morning from that Comet Observations database, and there's the uh, the web address of that. Well worth looking at to see how how a comet is behaving. As you can see, it went up to a magnitude of well, just about magnitude one at its maximum, and now it's declining down to as I say about three point five, and it will go a bit fainter as time goes by. And by August. Uh, beginning of August, maybe down to, well, looks like about six magnitude, something like that. And more difficult to see than the star of the same magnitude, but nevertheless visible with binoculars. Other things uh, coming soon, I just ought to add, add that the Perseid meteors will be with us on the 12th, 13th of August, or, and uh, Mark McIntyre, our meteor section director, warns, don't, don't rely upon that night, look the nights before and afterwards, it may be cloudy on the 12th, 13th, and th th there are quite a high, Zenithal highly rate is, is expected between 80 and 150, depending on who you listen to. But of course, that is the rate under ideal conditions if the radiant were in the zenith and the meteors were coming from the zenith. And if it's halfway up the sky, as it would be in this in the UK, um, even, even in the early morning, then you're only going to see a fraction of those meteors and you need a perfectly dark sky as well, which we won't have. And one thing I also want to draw your attention to is that there may be an outburst of the Gamma Draconid meteors on the 28th of July. Uh, that's a Monday, uh, next Monday, Tuesday. Um, and um, around midnight 30 UT, that's half past one BST, given possible uh, zenith hourly rate of 100 on, on that occasion, you could well have very ideal conditions because the zenith, the, the radiant itself will be pretty well overhead. So if you've got clear skies then, get out and have a look. Not too long to wait up, about half past, half past one in the morning, British summertime. So that is worth looking for. Also look on the Meteor section website for more information about that. And that is my presentation of what's coming up in the skies over the next uh, week or so, a uh, month or so. And back over to you, Stephen. Brilliant. Thank you very, very much. Um, well, we've we've uh, rattled on a little bit longer than expected because there were just so many questions and everyone had so many things to ask. So uh, uh, I, I think we should be calling it a day unless there's anything else anyone want, wants to uh, wants Oh, there were some raised hands I noticed during my talk Q&A there. Uh, oh, just says nice talk. Thank you. <laughs> Sorry, <I can't> <laughs> And chat, let me just see. Oh, yeah. Right, uh, Peter Smith says, managed to photograph the comet, but the weather has been against me for the last few nights. And Sheila says, I did see it twice through night this week through binoculars, marvellous. So um, get out there and look at the comet. Yeah, absolutely. We just, um, just need the, the weather to clear up and, and, and it will, I'm sure it will. Okay, well, thank you very much, everybody, for connecting. I, I hope you enjoyed it. Uh, I've actually I've found it really amazing, really, really interesting talks. And um, uh, connect again. Uh, our, our next uh, quarterly meeting, I think, is October. Is that correct, Robin? Yes, yes, end of October. Yeah. But we were talking this morning about possibility of other meetings. So uh, if there is one arranged, then we will, of course, let everybody know. And uh, Vicky video. Uh, will continue her very great, uh, very fun uh, Friday evening live talks uh, or chat show, I should say, hopefully next Friday. She's been very busy this week, so she couldn't do one, but those are well worth tuning in for, and they last about an hour, and they are the 
the the gross that we say make astronomy fun, make stargazing fun, and that really is fun. And I think she's she won't do crater or potato again because that's already been done, but uh, or crockery or rockery. But those are really good uh, uh, quizzes that uh, will test everybody, and uh, we look forward to more of those. So tune in next Friday on the uh, on the Facebook channel, facebook.com/slash popastro. Popastro indeed. Okay, thank you very much, everybody, for connecting. I hope you really enjoyed it. I certainly did. And uh, we'll speak again soon. So take care. Bye, everybody. I'll stop the recording if I can. Ah. There we are. And people are logging off. Now, let's see. Um, I don't know if I have the power to stop the the streaming. Uh, oh, yes, I'd better do that myself live on YouTube. Stop.